So this is 128, and we're down here. We're going to talk about the last piece of Chapter 7, and then I have a lot of demos, including a couple of new projects I've written in the last couple of days that I'm very happy about. I finally got Frida working. Um, so I think uh, Frida is very powerful, so we'll, we'll play with that. So let's start with the chapter, which is here. All right. So we're down to the third part of this chapter, which is storage and logging, insecure communication, and other things. So um, your phone has storage and logging. Now let me just bring up my phone. I've now got a root shell on my phone, so I might as well use it live. Um, I just rooted this phone a few minutes ago, so I can do ADB shell, and then I can do SU and become root. And now I can do LS minus L slash so when you do an ls minus l, you get the details of a file, and these are the permissions. The D tells you it's a directory, and the rest of the permissions, it's read, write, execute for the owner, read, write, execute for people in the same group, and read, write, execute for everyone else. So this file has the very common permission of 755 if you express this in base 2, three bits at a time, which is called octal. These three bits are on, so you call that 7. Um, the first and last of these three are on, so you call that five. So this is 755, which is the typical permission for an executable thing. Uh, all right, now that's a directory, though. It's a directory you can go into. So D is directories. The thing with a minus is not a directory. And uh, so those are the way Linux permissions look. All right. And that's the numerical sign. 777 is when all, is all possible permissions are there. This is something to avoid. This is like full control by everyone in Windows. It uh, is sloppy and usually more permissive than you want it to be. Uh, the default permissions for newly created masks and folders is uh, the umask, and for some ungodly reason, it's bit inverted. So if umask is 77, then everything you create starts out with read to execute, read to be execute for owner and nothing else. Anyway, that's how you determine the default permissions for newly created objects. And Android, like other Linux systems, has traversal checking, which Windows does not by default. So if you give someone permission to go into a folder, they also uh, a directory, I should say, they also have to have permission to go into all the containing directories, or they can't get in. Um, all right, so there was an Android wall app, um, some kind of firewall for Android, and they used the IP tables firewall. But what they did was they made a script that ran with 777 permissions running as root. And the problem is you've now let everybody write to that file by putting a 7 here. What you probably should have had was 755, where everybody can execute it and read it, but only the owner can write to it. That's why you never use 777. There's almost never a case where you actually want to do that. And so people could write to this file, and therefore you have a privilege escalation. I can just put commands in that file, and it will run them as root for me. So. That's uh, essentially how all privilege escalation exploits work. You find some way to add functionality to a process that's running with high privileges. So you can encrypt files uh, that, that protect your data from attackers, but if you don't use, now if you use public key encryption, you can encrypt files and the key is hidden on a server somewhere else, which is good, but almost nobody uses that for some unknown reason. So they often encrypt files and have a private key and then they hide it now, somewhere stupid like in the source code of their app. Without understanding that Android apps, you have something very close to the source code easily available. So this is what I've reported hundreds of times to companies that they're doing this. It's very common. So here's a thing called SQLite Cracker that will just try to decrypt the file, and it will try um, a whole series of words. I'm not quite sure I see where it is. Yes, this Dolly Pass here, I guess. Yeah, okay. So it takes strings on classes.dex, which is all the readable strings in the app, and it uses them and runs a loop and just tries every word in the app. So if anywhere in the app there is a string that contains the key, it will find it. And that's why you really shouldn't be putting secrets in hard-coded in your source code anywhere. Uh, so Android has SD cards. You can store things. And that's typically like a uh, USB stick, it's FAT32, so there are no restrictions. And old versions of Android would require write, permission to write to it, but no permissions at all to read from it, so anybody can. Um, and so here's common locations for it, SD card, and a couple of locations. Now all modern versions of Android require a special permission just to read from the SD card. 
and WhatsApp stored its database there so any app could just read it. It was AES encrypted, but there was just a static key that was always the same. So somebody found the key, which is not hard to do. The techniques we're teaching in this course would easily suffice for that. And then you could write a WhatsApp extract tool, which is essentially what I've done for hundreds of apps, write a tool that reverses their encryption and reveals their so-called encrypted stored password. So um, logging is useful when you're developing an app. You put things in the log, it made it to this step, it made it to that step, so you can debug it. But what you ought to do is turn off logging before you distribute the app, because it's possible that you'll log something private or useful to an attacker, and there is no reason to have logging turned on on a production app. So it is considered a poor practice to leave logging turned on. Anyway, it used to be every a large group of apps could read the logs. Now they've made it that only um, apps from Google, essentially, can read, read the logs. So you can enable that permission. However, from ADB, if you have a root shell, you can grant yourself that permission. So that's... Uh, but of course, if you have a root shell, then you can do everything, including um, reading your logs anyway. All right, and then there's insecure communications. We've already done projects about this. So one thing you could do is send data without any encryption at all over HTTP. That is ridiculous, and very few apps still do that, although there are a few. There are some websites that do it and some apps that do it, but they're, you know, they're 20 years out of date. Uh, but what a lot of people do is use HTTPS improperly, and it's quite common that they fail to validate the TLS certificate. Something like 5% of apps make this flaw, and we've done that in the projects with Burp. Then you can put an man in the middle attack on Burp, or many other ways to become a man in the middle on a network, and then you can steal the data. So you put up a fake certificate from your man in the middle, so you encrypt the data, but you encrypt it with the wrong key, which was provided to you by the attacker. So you hand the data to the attacker, the attacker then encrypts it and passes it on, so the server at the other end doesn't know this has happened, and it all happens because your device is willing to accept an unvalidated certificate. So one cure is to use certificate pinning. Certificate pinning is where you not only have the usual test, which is a certificate is vouched for by one of the certificate authorities, but you have some other factor, sort of like two-factor authentication about the certificate. Like the certificate must be from this issuer, or the certificate must have this serial number, or something like that. Um, this is one way to do it. And so that's where you have a second test so only the valid trusted certificate will be recognized and used, and therefore, even if somebody manages to install that extra trusted certificate on your phone to tell it to trust the man in the middle, it's still, the app still won't fall for it because it'll see that this certificate doesn't, is not the real certificate from my real app. So that's cool, but there are a lot of ways to overcome this. Um, here's some ways. Now, they say you can add a custom CA to the trusted certificate store. That's one way to bypass verification, but it won't bypass pinning. You could overwrite a package CA with a custom CA cert, and that would certainly, again, beat verification. I'm not sure about pinning. Frida, however, will probably do it all, and we're going to do a Frida project later if we have time. I got Frida working. Frida is incredible. Um, Frida is like a rootkit on your Android. You get to change the methods in the app by just overriding them with other methods. So you have some method that does something you don't like, like check if the certificate is valid, you can just make another method that replaces it and says, oh yes, it's valid. <laughs> it's bloody awesome. <laughs> All right, and of course then you can do the obvious thing. Yeah? Doesn't that work on iOS too? On yes, that yes. Like yes, it works on iOS too, absolutely. Although it's really a pain to set up on iOS. I would never be able to make a project I could really give students. It depends on your version of everything. Yeah. You've got to have Xcode. It's, yeah, I had to do it on my Mac. You got to put it on your Mac. You got to have a developer certificate. You got to have the right versions of everything. It's very painful. On Android, it's a lot less painful. I was I was only frustrated for about a day, so um, now I got it going pretty smoothly. Yeah. So very good. All right. So, uh, also, like I said, developers often turn off the validation for whatever reason, maybe for, for testing, um, and so they'll just have a routine that always returns true which is, of course, ridiculous, but that does happen pretty often. And that's what you would do if you wanted to use Frida to trick it. Now, web views are browsers inside an app, and I've already talked about this. Every app seems to have one, so you can view web pages in the app, which means your phone is full of junk. Your phone is full of 100 copies of a browser. Like, why is this? <laughs> this is very inefficient and illogical. But anyway, originally WebKit, now it's Chromium. It therefore runs in the app's context, and therefore the developer can hook the methods in there. And there was a news that came out recently that one of the famous apps, I think WhatsApp or Facebook or something, um, is adding JavaScript to the things 
you open in there, therefore snying on you and perhaps stealing data from it. You know, using an app that's under the using a browser under the control of an app is a questionable move. And that's another thing I've turned in must be dozens of apps for, is if you use their internal links to open like Facebook, they overcome a TLS. And so now you, I can steal your Facebook credentials because their browser is crap. And I don't know, and you could also steal your Google credentials because you have Google links in there. And I wonder why Google lets you distribute apps that leak Google credentials. That just seems like, if I was Google, I would have an attitude about that. But anyway, um, so you can control the configuration of WebView. You can tell it um, whether it's allowed to access content providers, whether it's allowed to load files directly. This is just asking for local file inclusion vulnerabilities like PHP. It can harvest files from the file system and serve them up in the app. Um, and here, uh, you can say whether the HTML file that was loaded from the files is allowed to access other files. So you can upload scripts and run them on other files. These just seem extremely dangerous <laughs> to have these things turned on. Um, and uh, set JavaScript enabled. This allows the web view to execute JavaScript. And here's one that allows you to put in plugins like Flash. I don't know if anybody's still using that. All right. And here, it'll save passwords that are rendered. Handy, they just give that to you right there instead of making you write it. Um, obviously, that's not a good idea for security. I don't know where it saves them. I think it can't be anywhere good. Anyway, all right, so you can, if it loads content over HTTP, then you can just modify the code like modify the JavaScript, add JavaScript to a page that doesn't have JavaScript. This is why HTTP is becoming extinct. Use, loading any browser page over HTTP is a huge security problem, even if you don't have anything sensitive on that page, because it allows an attacker to just modify the page and load script in your browser and execute script. Um, so, all right. Uh, don't remember what the deal is here. But, uh, all right, then there's the JavaScript interfaces, which is... Um, this connects JavaScript to Java, and this is what we're going to use with Frida. So you can add JavaScript to a web page, render it in a web page rendering system like WebView, and then it can run Java in there, and Java is what the app's written in. So you can define Java methods. This is in Java code. This is a JavaScript object, and you define it in JavaScript, which is a totally different language. So um, that connection is what makes it possible to modify the functionality of apps from web code. It's a very strange feature, and I just got it working earlier today, so I don't really understand much about it. I just learned how to do it once, but I plan to do it a lot more now that I finally got it working, because it, of course, is incredible, incredibly powerful. So uh, add JavaScript interface, therefore gives you arbitrary code execution. Um, in the old versions, there was a method where you could just exec execute commands here from JavaScript. Now, apparently, you can't do this anymore, thank God, but you just had an exec method you could just use to execute any command in JavaScript. I remember um, the very first Android phone, I had the very first one, and that one, every SMS you sent got executed as a Unix command as root. It was awesome. <laughs> you know, the, and this is a similar kind of ridiculous condition. Anyway, um, and there's a Drozer module to see if the JavaScript big bridge is turned on. Uh, if we're used, I'm not planning to use Drozer anymore, but I think any Vuln scanner would find it too. And then other things that happen are clipboards and local sockets. The clipboard, of course, is the same thing it is on Windows or anything else. You can copy data to the clipboard, and then you can paste it back in any app. So anything you put in the clipboard is clearly exposed to all the apps, and most password managers work this way. So in retrospect, now, wait a minute, that doesn't sound like such a great idea. It puts your, the password in the clipboard, you paste it in, and that means every other app could have stolen it. Um, that's right, it only saves the last thing, but if I would write an app that just pulled the clipboard 10 times a second, <laughs> um, anyway, there may be some defense against that, but on the surface of it, this seems like it's pretty obvious. Uh, well, yeah, but also it would be hard to like, filter, I mean, if people have actually good, or actually, well, I guess like the really good passwords, I guess you could filter that because they're so random. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, hopefully you could somehow specify that only this one app can read it, but if it's the clipboard, I don't think you can. Yeah, but I, even like what I was trying to say was that like, if you, like, people probably copy a bunch of random stuff, so it would be hard to filter what's a password and what's not. That's right. Oh, you certainly can't necessarily recognize a password going through, but I mean, I would like to have my password manager. Of course, the whole point of the password manager is it doesn't know what app you're putting that password into or care. 
So it seems, seems risky in principle. My phone clipboard stores many copy and paste. Oh, that's another fun fact. I didn't know that. Maybe it has a bunch of them, like a history file in there. I haven't looked, but that could be. Anyway, Drozer has a feature to read the clipboard, and I haven't found out how to do it without Drozer, but I bet you can do it with AM one way or another. Clipboard's supposed not to, not to save extra stuff, right? What's that? Clipboard's not supposed to save extra stuff. Uh, well, according to uh, HEMA, it does store many things. I, I always, ought to only stored one thing, but I haven't really looked. I know your history file stores hundreds of things, so in principle it could store more. Yeah, I, I, anyway, that's interesting. I do not know how much it stores. It would be good to like, uh, you know, if you have root access on the phone, which we do, I'm sure we can find it and look at it, but I haven't done it. And then there's something called local sockets. And these things are a little hard to understand. Now, you could open a listening address, like on loopback address, and then just send network traffic back to the same phone. This is something Windows does all the time. That's one way to do it. You can also declare something called a Unix socket that is not a network socket, but it's a listening object that can take data from another process on the same device without going through, supposedly, a network first. And that's another way to do it. And so you can expect network traffic going to the Internet, uh, with a lot of tools like Wireshark or Burp, and you can see data going by if it's not encrypted. All right, and there's other vectors like um, native code. There are some apps on Android that are not written in Java. Java is not actually compiled code. It's partially compiled to byte code, which then runs in a Java virtual machine called Dalvik. Um, and it is not really down to running at full privilege, let's say the full speed of the uh, compiled code. You can compile C++ and make normal C executables that run on your Android phone, just like any other version of Linux. It's just not commonly what's done. And if you do that, it's actually much harder to reverse. We're doing it in the 126 and 127 courses. Um, that's where you have to use things like Ida Pro and look at the assembly code. And uh, it's a whole lot harder than reversing Java code, which is ridiculously easy. Yes, absolutely. You have to compile it to the hardware, and a GCC, for example, has a whole bunch of cross-compilers to compile for every, every processor. But you do have to specify the processor you're compiling it for. Of course, you know, the our emulators are running on x86, so you wouldn't need anything different than that. It's usually x86 or ARM is the processor, and, and you, know, you can, yeah, you have to compile for the right processor. And of course, if you have compiled code, then you have C code, then you have all the old vulnerabilities, format, string, buffer overflow, and all the huge vulnerabilities that come with C could in principle be there. Does um, Vitra also take a look at uh, the ARM code? Uh, it's a good question. Does Ghidra do ARM code? And I think it does, but I haven't tried it. It would be a good thing to try, especially now that I got a lot of ARM machines to practice on. Now I got the M1 and I got ARM, I got like Androids that can run ARM, and I got the Raspberry Pi that runs ARM, so now I could make some ARM code. We could, in fact, I got some malware on ARM, it's M127, that we wrote for the Raspberry Pi. We could try taking that apart in Ghidra and see if it works. I think it'll work, but I do not really know. All right, so your Android manifest might allow backups, and it's true by default, so you can use ADB backup, and of course the backup contains all the app's data. So that is one possible attack. Um, all right, there's also something called the debuggable flag that's false by default. Uh, if you can debug an app, then there's something you can do. This is another thing I'd love to write a project on. I have never done this, but supposedly, if an app has debug turned on, you can turn on the debugger and see everything the app is doing and steal its secrets, and that sounds like good, clean fun, but I haven't tried it. Um, but that, that definitely belongs in the projects. Uh, all right, that's the point. It exposes your data. You can now do code execution. Um, you have to have USB debugging, but um, anyway, you debug an app, but you have to, it would have to be enabled. And so here's an example of the data that's exposed by the debugger. You can dump, and then you see uh, Android metadata, and here's the table of passwords, and here's passwords being going into there. Um, the name of the user, this looks like an encrypted password and there's the user's email, so you're seeing the data as it gets entered into there. It's leaking out through the debugger, so it'll let you read the variables as they go by. All right, so certificate pinning, we talked about. This is, uh, these are way other things to deal with. So if you have a app, like the Indian government app, mAdhar, that we're gonna hack in a future project, um, it detects that your device is rooted and won't let you start it on a rooted device. 
and it's also got certificate pinning. It won't accept a normal TLS certificate, so you have to defeat both of those things if you want to get this app to run on, uh, on a device and, and Trojan it. So one thing that's always the universal solution, which is what we're going to do, the first project I'm going to demonstrate, is Trojaning it. You just go and you take the part with APK tool, you turn it into this stuff called Smalley, which is very close to Java, this is the byte code, and then you just modify it, and I can just do things like comment out a bunch of lines, that's the simplest modification, and then it will no longer do that, and this is the root check. So you comment that out, now it no longer checks to see if you're root. That's the easiest one. I only know how to do like two or three things. This and how to log something is about all I figured out how to do in Smalley, but that's enough to make proof of concepts that show that I can do bad things. So then there's manipulating the runtime. This is what Frida does. You have low-level hooks in the Android system, like a rootkit on Windows, where you it calls the function, but I have grabbed that function and made it a different function. So the app no longer is doing what it thinks it's doing. It's doing something else, which is bloody awesome, and you do not need to take apart the app or recompile it or change the signature to do this, which is even more fun. You're like changing the ground underneath the app, the environment in which it runs. All right, and that's what Cydia does, uh, Cydia Substrate and Frida, and something called Exposed, which I haven't used. But of course, Cydia is the way I use all the time jailbreak iPhones, and uh, Frida, I now got working on Android, so I'm happy. Um, all right, so let's try uh, a Kahoot, and then start demos. I've got a lot of things to demo, so I'm glad we're a little early, so I have more time to do them, because the demos are fun. So this is 128.7c. Come on, it's moving around, dodging my cursor. Now that they're charging money, I have no right to complain. But it's good. Anyway, it's, what's that? Yeah, they're charging me. They've been threatening for like two years that you can't use it, have more than 10 players. And uh, they've grandfathered me in, and they finally like limited me to 10 players. So I paid them some money. I've been using it for like five to 10 years. So they deserve some money. So now I can have up to 50 players, which is good enough. I'm glad to see them earn some money. I've always figured like they're just going to vanish pretty soon if they keep on never charging money. A lot of people do this on the internet, and it offends me. I mean, this is America. You're supposed to charge money. And if you don't make a profit, you're not going to be around for long. It's not practical, anyway. Yeah, but that, most of that open source is from paid corporations. Like 90% of that stuff is written by people like Google and stuff. They're getting paid for it. And um, there's Twitter. Twitter never made any money. Well, this, no, I, I, they never were charging until recently. I don't know, I don't think it's open source. No. No, I wrote my own at one time, but it wasn't this much fun. I mean, the fun part is the music and the art and stuff. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I made a simple PHP script that will let you vote, but it's not very fun. You know, it just looks like a little web form. Yeah, yeah, no, this, 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 they made it fun like a game, and that's not cheap. Well, uh, that's because you're a communist, I don't know, this is, uh, this is, yeah, this is not the American way. You know, anyway, that's right, American way is all about profit, capitalism, anyway, yeah. All right, so what command, will, what command will create those permissions? Yeah, well, you know, the open source is kind of a socialist, not really a capitalist at all. Like the hippies. What's that? Socialism, that's right. Yep, all right, that's it, 644. This is six, read, write, execute, that's 110, and this is 100, so that's 644 is the octal for that. All right, so which data was widely available but then restricted in Android 4.1? 
That's cool. Stinky Cat says Black Hills. InfoSec's slogan is proudly sucking at capitalism because they do a lot of free training. Well, that's good. I think they also make plenty of money, though. They seem pretty well known. So I think this is what you do. If you want to be generous and give stuff away, you have to have another part of your business to actually make some money so you can stay alive. That's OK. You can have some charity, but you have to have some capitalism to back it up anyway. All right, so that's the logs, of course. All right, what feature is risky but used by password managers? Yep, the clipboard. All right. And what component might allow code execution via JavaScript? That was WebViews. WebViews let you inject Java in your JavaScript, which we are going to do. OK. All right. Sean. And JC. I sounds like close enough to a real name. I trade it. We'll figure it out. And that's a real name, too. All right, good. So I got the names. All right, let me stop this recording.